Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is my recommendations video for the prompt color for March Mystery Madness. Um, and I'm going to include my playlist for um, all content for March Mystery Madness in the cards, um, but you will find my other recommendations videos in there for the prompts. So the first, um, the first uh, few that I have are books that have the word color right in the title. The first is Color Scheme by Naya Marsh. This was published in 1943 and it is the 12th in her Roderick Allen series. Interestingly enough, Marsh considered this uh, her best written novel, which I think is interesting. Uh, set on New Zealand's North Island, Maurice Questing was lured into a pool of boiling mud and left to die. Chief Inspector Allen, far from home on a quest for German agents, knew that any number of people could have killed him. English exiles he'd hated, New Zealanders he'd despised, or the Maoris he'd insulted, even the spies he's thwarted, if he wasn't a spy himself. So I think this is interesting because the majority of her Roderick Allen series is set in England, um, but Naya Marsh is a New, New Zealander herself, and so I, I'm glad that she couldn't resist the urge to set one of her books on her own island. And The Color of Death by Bruce Alexander. This was published in 2000, and it's the seventh in his Sir John Fielding series. This is set in London in 1772. Suspicion and fear are running high in London as a gang of expert criminals terrorizes the town in a spree of robbery and murder. And in a time when slavery is still practiced in the colonies, there is but one peculiar clue to the identity of this group. The robbers are all black men. The blind judge, Sir John Fielding, is on the case to ensure that the guilty are punished and that no hasty conclusions are made. But when Sir John takes a bullet to the shoulder, his young protege, Jeremy Proctor, must lead this most delicate investigation under his bedridden counsel. And when Jeremy begins to turn over stones, he and Sir John come to find that black and white are never as simple as they seem. Uh, this book is notable for a word in the very first sentence that I had never heard before, and that word is con concat. I'm going to say this wrong. <laughs> concatenation. Concatenation. I had to look that up. It is a series of interconnected or interdependent things or events. So well done, Bruce Alexander, for finding a rare word to put in your book. By the end of that day in 1772, a concatenation of events would have, be would have begun which would alter considerably the circumstances of life there at number four Bow Street. <laughs> All right, and then finally, The Colors of All the Cattle by Alexander McCall Smith. This is from 2018, and it is the 19th in his uh, Number One Ladies Detective Agency series. I really enjoy this series, and I actually haven't read this book yet. This is where I am in the series, <laughs> but I'm recommending it because I would recommend any of his books um, from this series. When Ma... Uh, and some of these names I'm not great at saying. When, when Ma Patoquin suggests to Ma Remotesue that she run for a seat on the Gaborone City Council, Ma Remotesue is unsure until she learns that developers plan to build the flashy Big Fun Hotel next to a graveyard. Her opponent is none other than Ma Mukutsi's old nemesis, Violet Sepotho. Meanwhile, to impress a new girlfriend, Charlie volunteers to take on the role of lead investigator in a case for an old friend of Ma Remotesway's late father. With Charlie's inquiries landing him in hot water and election day fast approaching, Ma Remotesway will have to call upon her good humor and generosity of spirit to help the community navigate these thorny issues and prove that honesty and compassion will always carry the day. This is a series set in Botswana. Okay, and for my Christie commendations, I have Agatha Christie's The Mystery of the Blue Train. This is from 1928, and it is a Poirot. 
The train hurtled through the night, bearing its wealthy, coddled passengers toward the opulent pleasures of the south of France. But one of them would never again wake to the warm Mediterranean sun. Behind a carefully wrought framework of suspicion, Hercule Poirot, the zealous little Belgian detective, saw something else, a delicate, murderous web of deceit and greed, and at its center, the legendary cursed jewel known as the Heart of Fire. And then also, The Man in the Brown Suit by Agatha Christie. This is from 1924, and it is one of her Colonel Race um, books. And I, I actually, I really, really love this one. This is one of hers that's kind of like an adventure. It is a mystery, but it's kind of one of her adventure ones. Anne Bedingfield sets sail on a luxury cruise in search of adventure, little realizing that she'll soon have more than her share. When two strangers break in and pillage her cabin and then try to strangle her, Anne knows she must determine what they want before they strike again. Okay, now let's get into some um, historical mystery recommendations. This is The Secret History of the Pink Carnation by Lauren Willig. This is from 2006 and it's the first in this series. Right, so setting off for England, Eloise is determined to finish her dissertation on that dashing pair of spies, the Scarlet Pimpernel and the Purple Gentian. But what she discovers is something the finest historians have missed, the secret history of the Pink Carnation, the most elusive spy of all time. As she works to unmask this obscure spy, Eloise stumbles across answers to all kinds of questions. How did the Pink Carnation save England from Napoleon? What became of the Scarlet Pimpernel and the Purple Gentian? And will Eloise Kelly escape her bad luck and find a living, breathing hero of her own? This is a really fun uh, historical spy series. And then, The Birth of a Blue Satan by Patricia Wynn. This is from 2001, and it is the first in this series. And I love this series. This is great, great fun in historical mystery. In the, tra the Romantic Tradition of Alexander Dumas and Sir Walter Scott. The year is 1715. George of Hanover, who speaks no English, has succeeded to the throne of Great Britain. James Francis Stuart, exiled in France, prepares an invasion to reclaim his father's crown. The Whigs have convinced King George that the Tories are loyal to the pretender. Returning home from his three-year grand tour, Gideon, Viscount St. Mars, comes home to find that his father, the once powerful Earl of Hawkehurst, has been banished from court. The Earl's bitterness threatens Gideon's hopes to marry the daughter of a Whig. Then, violence strikes, and Gideon is falsely accused of murder. At a time when justice is determined by power, he discovers that his only recourse is disguise. Deception and greed wreak havoc on his fate. Danger and intrigue pave his path. His only solace is the friendship and help of a woman whose heart is as true and whose wits are as sharp as his own. With the highwayman Blue Satan, Patricia Wynne has created a masked hero to rival the Count of Monte Cristo, Zorro, and the Scarlet Pimpernel. Together with his true-hearted friend Hester Keene, he moves from the palaces of earls to the dens of thieves, solving the mystery that alters their lives. Rich in detail and language of the early Georgian period, this story will transport readers back to an era unrivaled in elegance and romantic adventure. So yeah, Blue Satan is the name he takes on when he disguises himself as a highwayman. Super, super fun. Okay. Tomb of the Golden Bird by Elizabeth Peters. This was published in 2006, and it is the 18th in her Amelia Peabody series. This one is set in 1922. Banned forever from the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings, eminent Egyptologist Radcliffe Emerson's desperate attempt to regain digging rights backfires, and his dream of unearthing the tomb of the little-known king Tutankhamun is, dam is dashed. Now Emerson, his archaeological wife Amelia Peabody, and their family must watch from the sidelines as Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter discover the greatest Egyptian treasure of all time. But the Emersons 
own less impressive excavations are interrupted when father and son Ramses are lured into a trap by a strange group of villains ominously demanding answers to a question neither man comprehends. And, and it will fall to the ever-intrepid Amelia to protect her endangered family, and perhaps her nemesis as well, from a devastating truth hidden uncomfortably close to home, and from a nefarious plot that threatens the peace of the entire region. A Suspicion of Silver by P.F. Chisholm. This is from 2018, and it is the ninth and, I think, last in her Sir Robert Carey series. I also really enjoy this series, but I have a hard time get a hold, getting a hold of the books. So I haven't read the whole series and I've also not read them in order. <laughs> so what I would love is if I could get a hold of the whole series and then read them in order, that would be awesome. Uh, 1593, Sir Robert Carey, Deputy Warden of the West March, rides for Leith in pursuit of the would-be assassin Joachim Hochester. Hochstetter, sorry. His plot to murder King James foiled has Hochstetter set ship for the continent or ridden south for England and quite literally gone to ground. Originally from Augsburg, Hochstetter's family runs a smelting business in Keswick and a colony of German miners, amid a colony of German miners. Just how far would they go to protect one of their own? Sir Robert's other problem, his dour and difficult sergeant Henry Todd has disappeared somewhere on the snowy moors. They found his horse, but there's no sign of the rider. Sir Robert's searches will see him sorely tested both north and south of the border, above and below ground, at Swords Point and at Fuse's End. So this is a series set at, in the very north of Scotland, sorry, the very north of England, right on the border of Scotland. And um, a couple more in the historical series. This is The House of the Red Slayer by Paul Harding, um, uh, which is a pseudonym for Paul Doherty. So if you see a newer release of this book, it'll probably have Paul Doherty on the name. This is from 1992, and it is the second in his Sorrowful Mysteries of a Brother, Athelstan series. In December 1377, as London prepares for Christmas, a great frost has the city in its icy grip. In its icy grip. Even the Thames is frozen from bank to bank. Murder, revenge, and treachery also make their presence felt, for an ancient grudge is about to be settled in a city seething with discontent. The constable of the Tower of London, Sir Ralph Whitton, is found murdered in a cold, bleak chamber of the North Bastion. The door is still locked from the inside and guarded by trusted retainers. So how did the assassin slip across a frozen moat and climb the sheer wall of the fortress to commit such a dreadful crime? And why was Sir Ralph so terrified of the message he received a few days before his death? A crude drawing of a ship and a flat sesame seed cake? The Dominican friar Athelstan and Sir John Cranston, the fat, wine-loving coroner of the City of London, are appointed to investigate these mysteries. They soon discover Sir Ralph's murder is only the first in a series of macabre killings which have their roots in a terrible act of betrayal committed many years previously. And the last in this series is The Blue by Nancy Bilyeu. Um, I absolutely love this book. I gave it five stars when I read it, and I totally want to reread it again right away. Um, it was it was so good, and this cover is just stunning. How far will they go for the most coveted color in the world? In 18th century London, porcelain is the most seductive of commodities. Fortunes are made and lost upon it. Kings do battle with knights and knaves for possession of the finest pieces and the secrets of their manufacture. For Genevieve Blanchet, an English-born descendant of Huguenot refugees, porcelain holds far less allure. She wants to be an artist, a painter of international repute, but nobody takes the idea of a female artist seriously in London. If only she could reach Venice. When Genevieve meets the charming Sir Gabriel Courtney, he offers her an opportunity she can't refuse. If she learns the secrets of porcelain manufacture, he will send her to Venice. But in particular, she must learn the secrets of the color blue. 
The ensuing events take Genevieve deep into England's emerging industrial heartlands where not only does she learn about porcelain, but also about, also about the art of industrial espionage. So I love that this book um, had kind of unique a unique setting and, and um, uh, was about things that, that really I don't, I haven't read about before in historical mystery. So I love that it's set in the world of porcelain making, porcelain manufacture, which was interesting in and of itself. But then the, the discovery of how to make certain colors um, and what people will do to find those colors or the recipes for those colors was just fascinating. Okay, and then I have a cozy to recommend for you. This is Aunt Dimity and the Deep Blue Sea by Nancy Atherton. This was from 2006 and it is the 11th in her Dimity series. When Laurie Shepard's husband receives a series of death threats aimed at her and their twin boys, she retreats to a remote island off the Scottish coast and to a fabulous castle restored by an eccentric adventurer. There she is drawn into a mystery that may involve an illegal smuggling operation, or worse. Why has a human skull washed up on the beach? Is a desolate island really the best place to hide from a murderer? And will Aunt Dimity's supernatural kibitzing help Laura solve the case before it's too late? Okay, I have a few um, in the vintage uh, crime category. Golden Age crime, classic crime, whatever you want to call it. This is The Black Dudley Murder by Marguerite Allingham, also called The Crime at Black Dudley. This was published in 1929 and it is the very first in her Albert Campion series. Dark Doings at Black Dudley. You are cordially invited to a weekend house party at Black Dudley Manor. While there, you will participate in a gruesome ritual. Your host will be brutally murdered. You will be held hostage, and someone will interrogate you in a most unpleasant manner. But never fear, Albert Campion is a fellow guest, and you just might survive to tell the tale. Golden Ashes by Freeman Wills Crofts. This is from 1940. The new Sir Geoffrey Butler, nope, Bueller, is earning his living in an American office when he unexpectedly inherits the title and Ford Manor with its collection of priceless pictures. Betty Stanton, had been, who has been left a penniless widow, is glad to take a post as his lady housekeeper lady housekeeper. <laughs> she is surprised when she finds out that Sir Geoffrey is having a number of pictures cleaned. Her friend Agatha Bark is the wife of a leading art expert. But Geoffrey is in Italy and the house empty when the disaster occurs. Is there any connection between the calamity at Ford Manor and the missing Char Charles Bark who registered at a hotel in Paris? Inspector French is called in and from a mosaic of detail equally available to the reader, reconstructs the pattern of a most cunning and complex crime. Death in a White Tie by Naya Marsh. This is from 1938 and it is the seventh in her Roderick Allen series. Death by suffocation is much quicker than most people imagine. Whoever murdered Lord Robert Gospel, bunk Bunchy to his friends must have calculated on this for he knew that death would have to be quick enough and quiet enough to enable him to surprise and smother Bunchy in a brief taxi ride together and then emerge dressed as his victim whilst the taxi continued its journey to deposit the other passenger. This much Chief Inspector Allen can deduce when he proceeds to probe the mystery of his friend's murder. For Bunchy was his friend, and in a way he felt partially responsible for Bunchy's death because he had been helping Allen privately in trying to establish the identity of a particularly loathsome blackmailer. In fact, Bunchy was about to go on to Scotland Yard the very hour he was murdered, and all that eventually reached Allen was his corpse. The Red Lamp by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This is from 1925. The first death seemed a natural one. The second, in spite of its violence, could have been an accident. 
the disappearance of Maggie Morrison could have been due, as the police claimed, to the grim work of a twisted killer. But none of these theories explained the wandering, ghostly radiance of the red lamp. And I like that this one has, you're looking into the house through the window on the front cover, and then the back cover, it looks like maybe the back of the house or something. I think that's cool. Okay, and then The Red House Mystery by A.A. A. Milne from 1922. This is a classic locked room mystery, if uh, that's your deal. Unfortunately, Winnie the Pooh is not in this story. <laughs> a hot, drowsy afternoon at Red House, home of wealthy Mark Ablett. Downstairs, the servants are rest resting. Outside, the secretary is reading. Then the peace is shattered by a piercing cry for help and a gunshot. Minutes later, Robert Ablett's body is found in a locked room with no possible means of entry or exit. Robert has suddenly returned from, to his brother from abroad. Mark has suddenly vanished. Guilt is the logical conclusion. Too logical for Anthony Gilliam and Bill Beverly, who tackled the case without clues to find an ingenious killer and a cold-blooded motive for murder. The Ivory Dagger by Patricia Wentworth. This was published in 1950, and it's the 18th in her Miss Silver series. Lila Dryden was awake. It was no nightmare or a fantasy of sleep. Sir Herbert Whitehall, the man she intended to marry, was dead. His blood was on her hand, warm, sticky, and unreal. On the floor, at her feet, lay the ivory dagger. Miss Silver was puzzled. It seemed an open and shut case of murder. But for what gain? It was true that Lila had loathed and detested Herbert Whitehall, yet she had nothing to profit from murdering him. And there were, of course, his relatives. How they stood to benefit was uncertain because the will suddenly and mysteriously disappeared. With only half-answered questions and very few facts before her, Miss Silver had to admit that someone was playing an extremely clever and careful game of murder. The Red Box by Rex Stout. This was published in 1937 and it's the fourth in his Nero Wolf series. These are set in New York City. A lovely woman is dead, and the fortunes of overextended theatrical producer Llewellyn Frost depend on solving the mystery of the red box. Two pounds of candied fruit, nuts and creams covered with chocolate and laced with potassium cyanide. Another Nero Wolf, this is um, The Black Mountain by Rex Stout, published in 1954. It's the 23rd in his Nero Wolf series. Enranged by the cold-blooded killing of his closest friend, Wolf leaves not only his home, but his country as well. In, in an exotic land where his life depends on a false passport, a knapsack filled with chocolate bars, and a razor-sharp knife, the great man faces the most dangerous adventure of his career. He goes to Montenegro, and that's huge because Nero Wolf very rarely even leaves his house. And then a couple here, um, these are um, a series that my husband is collecting, um, but the entire series have colors in the title, so I thought I should um, show them to you. This is A Purple Place for Dying by John D. MacDonald from 1964. This is the third in his Travis McGee series. And this is The Quick Red Fox, also from 1964. This is the fourth in that series. Um, Travis McGee, part rebel, part philosopher, and every inch his own man. Travis McGee is the rugged, sexy Florida beach bum with a special genius for helping friends in trouble or avenging their deaths. So if that's the style of uh, mystery that you like, you might want to check out the Travis McGee series for this prompt. And then a few in the police procedural or um, private detective category. This is The Black House by Peter May. This was published in 2009 and it is the first of his Lewis trilogy. 
when a grisly murder occurs on the Isle of Lewis that bears similarities to a brutal killing on the mainland, Edinburgh detective and native islander Finn MacLeod is dispatched to the Outer Hebrides to investigate, embarking at the same time on a voyage into his own troubled past. As Finn reconnects with the people and places of his tortured childhood, the desolate but beautiful island and its ancient customs once again begin to assert their grip on his psyche. Every step towards solving the case brings Finn closer to a dangerous confrontation with the dark events of the past that shaped and nearly destroyed his life. This book was the winner of the Barry Award for Best Novel. And then The Black Tower by P.D. James. This was published in 1975 and it is the fifth in her Adam Dalgleish series. Hoping for a little investigation to enliven his convalescence, Commander Adam Dalgleish accepts an invitation from an old friend to visit Dorset and solve a problem. But when he arrives at Toynton Grange, a private home for the disabled, he discovers that his host has died suddenly. Other, more mysterious deaths follow, and Dalgleish finds that the problem is an enclosed world seething with malice, intrigue, hatred, and murder. And then finally, Black and Blue by Ian Rankin. This is from his Rebus series. This was published in 1997, and it's the ninth, sorry, the eighth in that series. It won the Crime Writers Association Macallan Gold Dagger for Fiction. Rebus is juggling four cases trying to nail one killer who might just lead back to the infamous Bible John. And he's doing it under the scrutiny of an internal inquiry led by a man he has just accused of taking backhanders from Glasgow's Mr. Big. Added to that, there are TV cameras at his back investigating a miscarriage of justice, making Rebus a criminal in the eyes of a million or more viewers. Just one mistake is likely to mean an unpleasant and not particularly speedy death, or worse still, losing his job. <laughs> Okay, and then I have one in the other category. This is Little Black Lies by Sharon Bolton. This was published in 2015. We were inseparable until the day she killed my sons. This is set in, um, on the Falkland Islands in the 90s. A, what's the worst thing your best friend could do to you? Admittedly, it wasn't murder. A moment's carelessness, a tragic accident, and two children are dead. Yours. Living in a small island community, you can't escape the woman who destroyed your life. Each chance encounter is an agonizing reminder of what you've lost. Your family, your future, your sanity. How long before revenge becomes irresistible? With no reason to go on living, why shouldn't you turn your darkest thoughts into deeds? So now, what's the worst thing you can do to your best friend? Okay, those are my recommendations for the prompt of color. Um, have you found anything in here that piques your interest? Have you read any of these books? I would love to chat with you about them in the comment section down below. And I would also love to know what you're planning to read for this prompt for March Mystery Madness. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.